What's going on guys, this is Rob, and welcome to Halloween Week on Comics Explained. Now for those of you guys who are new to the Rob Corps, Halloween Week, this is the week where we cast aside our normal schedule and we cover Halloween stuff. So, I have been diligently trying to find something that I can do on Marvel Comics, and it occurred to me, the Age of Ultron versus Marvel Zombies story. Like, this would be something really cool to do, because it's something that we've never done, and uh, mostly because this came out after Halloween last year. <laughs> <laughs> so I figure it would be really fun to do. Now, I want to provide a little bit of basis behind this. So in, in Marvel Comics, as we know, we saw the big Secret Wars event. And the Secret Wars event was designed to show us Battle World and so on, and then lead into what we thought was a reboot of the Marvel Universe. But within the Secret Wars line of stories, while a majority of everything dealt with Battle World, uh, we also saw some side stories, some tie-ins that gave us these different depictions of life within Battle World. We saw stuff like a continuation of Days of Future Past, this alternate reality, so on and so forth. And all of this came about because when the Beyonders uh, seemed to destroy the multiverse, and when they were laying waste to everything, uh, Doctor Strange, Doctor Doom, and the Molecule Man, Owen Reese, defeated the Beyonders. And Doctor Doom used the power of the Beyonders to literally just grab all these different universes that remained and keep what fractions of the multiverse he could alive in the form of Battle World. And so this segment of, uh, of you know, the, I guess, Age of Ultron versus the Marvel Zombies, this basically deals with the bad part of Battle World. <laughs> <laughs> this deals with the hood of Battle World. So within the main territories of Battle World itself, I guess around all the main territories, you have what's called the shield or the wall. And the shield basically protects uh, everybody from a combination of the Age of Ultron robots and the uh, zombies and the forces of Annihilus. Now, this story initially picks up with Tigra. Now, Tigra is a small time character in the realm of Marvel Comics. She was an Avenger for a while, and I think this is an alternate reality version of her. It doesn't really matter. But she's basically been sentenced to uh, to she's been sentenced to be sent over the wall, and that's how things work in Battle World. You're not really executed. Whenever you commit a crime, like if you were to cross barriers into another realm, or you were to just do something that Doctor Doom doesn't like, you look at him funny. He's going to send you over the wall, and you're going to have to survive as long as you can. But most everybody who goes over the wall is either killed by the forces of Annihilus, they're killed by the Ultron robots, or they're killed by the zombies. Now, with Tigra trying to make her way through here, we're not really shown exactly what it is that happens to her. All we really know is that she is sent over. Here here and she's being tracked by the combined forces of the zombified uh, Sabretooth and the Mole Man and a host of other, you know, Marvel zombies that all reside here. And of course, much like the original Marvel zombies story, which I have, you'll find that playlist down in the description. In fact, I'll throw this in the playlist as well. But in the um, in the original Marvel zombies, zombies story, they basically all still have their minds, right? You know, they, they have their powers, they have their minds. It's just they're consumed by a desire for flesh. And they all talk about this. They basically say, hey, look, if I find her first, I'm going to eat her and then you guys can have whatever's left. And so it's basically every man for himself in the realm of the Marvel Zombies universe. Now, while she, while Tigra is able to hold her own against one or two zombies, the problem is that once they all sniff her out, she's literally surrounded by all of them. And it basically seems as though she's never going to make it out alive. But the problem with this is almost immediately after she's cornered, these zombies are met by the arrival of the Ultron robots who, who deem them as being imperfect and begin the process of killing them off. Now, this is one of the big differences. Within the main battle world story, itself as part of Secret Wars, you could not cross barriers. Like the inhabitants of the Age of, I'm sorry, the inhabitants of the Days of Future Past universe could not cross over into the uh, Age of Apocalypse universe. If anybody did that, they'd be sentenced over the wall. And so we don't know if this is exactly what happened with her, but within this territory on the other side of the shield, that doesn't apply. It's basically no man's land. Whoever lasts longer can. And it's more or less where Doom just turns a blind eye to everything that's going on. So for those of you guys who watched Game of Thrones, uh, imagine this as being on the other side of the wall, you know, on the other side of the black wall when guys go and they serve the black. Uh, imagine this basically being the territory or the domain of the wildlings. It is kind of whatever happens, happens. Now, what we also do is we get a little backstory here with regards to the Age of Ultron event. And this is why James Robinson is so cool, because remember, these are all alternate realities, some of which we've seen and some of which we haven't seen. But in the reality where this Age of Ultron domain comes from, what we're told is that in this timeline, when Hank Pym created Ultron and activated him, instead of wiping you know, Hank Pym's mind of Ultron itself. Instead, the Ultron robot killed Hank Pym. And because of this, the Masters of Evil you know, were, were basically successful in killing off all the Avengers. There was no one there to warn the Masters of Evil of what the plan of Ultron was, that Ultron was actually a robot, that Ultron planned to dominate the world. And so the Masters of Evil fought alongside Ultron, they wiped out the Avengers, and then Ultron waited and basically just built himself further 
until he was at the point where we had Ultron 8 and Ultron 9, and those forces working together wiped out the rest of the world's superheroes. I mean, they killed them all. They killed the X-Men. They killed uh, they killed Namor the Submariner. They killed Storm. I mean, they even killed Kitty Pride, and that's just messed up because she was a teenager, but they killed everybody. And so the result is that this version of Ultron took over everything. Now, as we know, when the multiverse collapsed, this was one of the realities that Doctor Doom grabbed and basically preserved. But remember, it's only a fraction of this reality. It's only a small section. So it's like a little, a little itty bitty part of, you know, of what that Earth would have looked like. But the fact remains here that we switch over to the wall itself. And the wall, I guess on this wall, is a variation of Hank Pym from an alternate reality, more like a Western reality or something like that. But the idea here is that it's somewhere along the line in his timeline, he tried to create a version of Ultron for, you know, his time era, a very primitive version, and he had basically crossed over barriers in order to grab some materials that would allow him to do this. Doctor Doom found out about it, and most likely at the direction of the Thor Corps, which operated as the police on Battleworld, this version of Hank Pym was taken to the wall, and he's been sentenced to be thrown over. The difference with this is that the woman who's sentencing him, or at least who's going to be throwing him over the wall, she and Hank Pym were together for a time, and so she pulled a few strings, and I guess it's a good situation, but she pulled a few strings and he's not going to simply just be thrown over the wall. Instead, he gets to decide which part of the wall he gets to go over. So it's really tantamount to, yes, Hank Pym is going to die, but he gets to choose how he's going to die, uh, which is really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact remains here that once he makes his decision, once he's basically told about the three territories and that one of these territories houses the Ultron robots, his intrigue and technology more or less forces his hand and he decides to choose the realm of the Ultron robots. And so once he's set upon this area, he begins exploring this different territory, exploring all the different things that are here, but he eventually comes across a couple of uh, zombies that have killed one of these Ultron robots. And our initial thought is, well, it's going to be curtains for, for this version of Hank Pym, right? Like he's going to die. And that's just the way it is. Like there's, there's nothing, nothing to do here uh it's the end of him. But in the midst of, you know, these zombies getting ready to attack him, the zombies of Rhino and Owl Man, I think it is, which is interesting, uh, they're suddenly incinerated. And when Hank Pym turns around, he's met with the arrival of this reality's versions, or I guess this uh, Age of Ultron version of Vision and Jim Hammond, the Human Torch and Wonder Man, Simon Williams. Now from here, we switch back to the Deadlands and we pick up with Colonial Punisher. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Colonial Punisher is probably the greatest thing that I've ever seen because he's talking trash just like the regular Punisher does but he's using like colonial phrases you know so he's like he's like come carry on come rank and base company and come one come all let's dance a merry jig <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And, and I really wish the Punisher talked like this more often. But again, this just basically shows us that almost anybody who's thrown over the wall is going to be completely incinerated. But the difference is that again, much like Tigra, where Colonial Punisher, I really want to see him in all new, all different Marvel. I just want to say that. I really want to see more Colonial Punisher. But while uh, Colonial Punisher is trying to get away from the uh, from the zombies, uh, these various zombies, or I guess he, is suddenly incinerated by the Ultron robots. And one of the Ultron robots, version 432, basically says that uh, these all these different you know zombies are considered to be imperfect and because the mission of the Ultron robots is to purify everything that is imperfect they're going to wipe out these zombies so again this is really just James Robinson setting the stage for uh, you know for, for what's going on with this reality to basically show us how bad things are going to be now, jumping back to the shield, what we learn is that this woman that had sentenced Hank Pym, or I guess had given Hank Pym the opportunity to decide where he was going to go, this is actually the Western version of Janet Van Dyne from the Western Marvel Universe line of stories, which, by the way, are absolutely amazing. But it seems as though she's effectively abandoned her shift and it seems as though she's going into the realm of these Ultron robots for the purpose of grabbing Hank Pym and bringing him back. Now, jumping back to Hank Pym alongside uh, Vision and Jim Hammond and, uh, and Simon Williams, we learned that they've actually built this giant refuge within the realm of this Age of Ultron territory. Not only that, it doesn't house just them, it also houses a multitude of other superheroes as well. Basically people who were able to survive the Age of Ultron timeline and had a uh, hidden out within this realm that has a force field that either Ultron doesn't know about or Ultron is unable to get past. But what, what we're told, or at least what, what I suspected anyway, was that when this initial timeline was created, that uh, Jim Hammond and, you know, that uh, Simon Williams and Vision were able to survive simply because of the fact that they're androids, or at least uh, two of them are androids. And that's exactly what we're told. What we're informed is that because Jim Hammond was an android, he was created as the original Human Torch by uh, by whatever his doctor's name was, I can't remember, um, that he basically is 
is considered to be perfect in the eyes of Ultron because Ultron doesn't view him as a normal human being. Not only that, the Vision was created by Ultron. So the Vision, or I guess uh, Ultron views the Vision as his son, so to speak. Now, Simon Williams is a whole different beast here. And the reason why I say that is, yes, the Vision was created using the brain patterns of Simon Williams. The difference is that once Simon Williams was, you know, considered to have been dead, he was reconstituted using ionic energy. And so he's basically energy in human form. And so we can't technically be killed by Ultron. And so as a result, he just kind of exists off on his own. Now, when Ultron began the process of taking over the world, you know, Vision and Jim Hammond and Simon Williams didn't really like what it was that Ultron was doing. And so the result was that they began to, you know, collude against Ultron and they began to kill off Ultron's robots. They effectively rebelled against him. And in response, they began to create a, a salvation of sorts for themselves and built this refuge to not only house them, but to also grab whatever survivors were out there and bring them to this location in order to ensure that they didn't have to deal with the uh, being eradicated by Ultron. And so what this does is this effectively creates a situation whereby we now have Hank Pym from this Western universe with a base of operations, but he also has, you know, a desire and a knowledge for technology, but he's also wildly smart, even for his own generation. And so the idea here is that they bring him to this location for the purpose of more or less figuring out a way to defeat Ultron itself. And so from here, we transition to the main citadel of Ultron. And what we learn is that instead of Ultron and these zombies at least seeming to fight each other right off the bat, instead, a kind of pact has been struck. And the Ultron robots are working alongside Magneto, who seems to be the leader of these, uh, of these zombies. And the idea is that they're going to join forces and they're effectively going to go into Battle World itself. They're going to cast off Doctor Doom and they're going to take everything over. Now, they both have different motives here. Because the zombies just want to consume people, uh, the zombies would really work as a purifier of sorts for the Ultron robots in the sense that the zombies would go in and they would wipe out all the different humans and they would probably just consume them in their entirety and not really give them the opportunity to become uh, to become zombies. And this would basically set the stage for the Ultron robots to go in and to simply just take over, to basically just establish base of operations and so on and so forth. What we're going to learn is that the most predictable scenario unfolds as a result of this. Now, transitioning back to the sanctuary with Hank Pym and Vision and Jim Hammond and Simon Williams, where this story initially seemed uh, interesting in terms of how it was unfolding, at this point, it just goes completely off the rails. So what we learn is that yes, Jim Hammond is a synthetic man, uh, except for a particular area of himself. And the reason why we know that this area is not synthetic is because he got a chick pregnant. Now, how it is, that a synthetic man impregnates a woman is a question I do not have the answer to, uh, and I'm sure nobody else does either. But this was apparently something that was entirely possible in the realm of Marvel Comics. But having said that, we also learned that each of these individuals has someone that they've latched onto. They have basically a person in their life that is their significant other. Sometimes these people are, are half hybrid, you know, human and machine. Sometimes they're completely human. But whatever the case may be, it's really just, you know, James Robinson giving us a view of the fact that each of these individuals has created a life for themselves, especially when it comes to the case of Vision. We know Vision as a person being in a relationship with the Scarlet Witch Wanda Maximoff, but it seems as though when the Age of Ultron event initially occurred in this reality, and Hank Pym was killed and the rest of the superheroes were destroyed, that Agatha Harkness, who's a legitimate witch, was one of the survivors. And it seemed as though she had basically developed a relationship with Vision, which is kind of weird because she's really old. But the fact remains here that, again, you know, with, with Janet Van Dyne, we, we also get a little bit of backstory between her and Hank Pym from this Western reality. And we learn that Janet Van Don was basically working in a burlesque house and that Hank Pym himself had been working on again this this mechanical man but because of the fact that he had reached out to locations that uh, were outside of the realm he had drawn the attention of the Thor Corps and the result of this was that the Thor Corps had taken him prisoner and basically you know, sentence him to being thrown over the wall. Now, transitioning back to Ultron and the zombies, my initial thought was that the, you know, Ultron and the zombies were going to turn on one another. But what we learn is that Ultron had actually found a way to merge uh, his Ultron technology along with the zombies into a single entity. And the reason why he does this is he says that individually, there's no way they can penetrate the forces of the sanctuary, kill everybody inside, and then expand their reach into uh, battle world itself. He says that in order for them to be successful, they have to basically meld the zombies and the Ultron robots into singular beings, which will enhance their power in a multitude of different ways. Now, when this happens and they immediately launch an attack against the uh, against the sanctuary and the forces of, uh, of Hank Pym and uh, Vision and, and Wonder Man, Simon Williams, and so on, the initial question is, what do they do next? 
you know, what do they do now? And what happens is Hank Pym comes to the realization that by studying the Ultron technology, by studying, you know, how the Ultron robots work, that they all basically have a hive mind. And when Ultron had begun the process of experimenting and merging the Ultron robots into zombies, God, this story is ridiculous. By merging the Ultron zombies into, uh, into I guess, merging the Ultron robots into the, the zombie bodies, that he had used the energy of Simon Williams to do it. Now, Simon Williams wasn't lending his energy in this situation. Ultron had basically just learned how to duplicate the ion energy. And as a result, these zombies slash Ultron robots basically all share a hive mind, meaning if they can disrupt the signal, they can shut down all of these zombies slash Ultron robots and uh, and be free of their, in, you know, their insanity. The problem with this is that it would basically combine the life essence, so to speak, of Jim Hammond and the Vision and Simon Williams to pull it off. And so what each of these guys do is they begin the process of saying their goodbyes. Now, for Jim Hammond, this is a huge deal because, again, somehow he got a woman pregnant, but he's basically walking away from the prospect of being a father. For Vision, he's walking away from his significant other and the same thing with uh, um, with Simon Williams. And so, again, you know, this is really just James Robinson kind of giving us a, uh, a scenario, sort of an ironic situation, that the creator of Ultron or, or someone who was capable of creating Ultron would, in turn, create a way to defeat Ultron. So it's just sort of the situation that everything goes in full circle. But it's also highlighting the idea that this version of Hank Pym is not nearly as smart as the version of Hank Pym that originally created Ultron just because he doesn't have the same access to the same kind of technologies. But it also shows us that with enough time, he can learn what he needs in order to pull this off. And so with the Ultron slash zombies breaking into the sanctuary, getting past the force field, and, uh, you know, basically killing off all these different survivors, uh, when the situation seems at its worst, and it seems as though the, you know, Dr. Octopus version, or it looks like a Dr. Octopus version of uh, the of the zombies was going to attack, um, you know, Hank Pym, ultimately Janet Van Dyne makes her arrival and she's able to uh, to save his life. And so from here, we basically have him activating the machine, this, this sort of pulse, and uh, Simon Williams, Vision, and Jim Hammond getting inside and allowing their, allowing to merge with the signal in order to send out an energy uh, pulse to all the Ultron robots that ultimately reboots them, more or less. It allows Hank Pym to control all of them individually as part of a collective whole and basically turn them into a police force that essentially just guards the entirety of, uh, of this sanctuary. And that's where the story ends. Um, this is probably one of the worst stories I've ever read, but at the very least, it was interesting. Um, it fits into the Halloween theme, I guess, you know, with regards to zombies and stuff. But it's no wonder why <laughs> this story got uh, rough reviews. It's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ultron robots merging with Marvel zombies is a stretch in and of itself. What we saw here, I don't even know how to begin to describe. Uh, it went totally off the rails. It's the best <laughs> best way I know how to describe this. Anyway, uh, if you agree that this comic was rough around the edges, uh, make sure you guys hit the sub button, become part of the Rob Corps, and um, yeah, make sure you guys drop a like and leave a comment. Let me know what you all think, because I'm kind of curious, and I will catch you all later. Peace.